let's go ahead and move forward here to this next this next segment we want to talk about some guys that are in the top 32 of pff's latest big board that maybe based off what the nfl's you know what the nfl's seeing in these players and what we've heard from when we're talking to media and mm-hmm. other uh talent evaluators at the senior bowl guys that could potentially fall out of the first round and be value picks at the top of uh day two and i want to start first with you know the highest guy on our big board that did not make your latest mock draft what you think will happen or in, in the 2020 nfl draft mm-hmm. was curtis weaver of boise state and i think talk to me about what you know what those concerns are you're hearing from the NFL as opposed to what you see in this player athletically he does not have basically the profile Mm -hmm. profile that you want from an NFL edge defender like he is not doesn't have necessarily the length doesn't have the get off doesn't have the bend okay like that's yeah and and then it's almost if he were doing this so if he were uh you know doing this at Ohio State if he was putting his production up and he's in the Big Ten and he's facing real offensive tackles week in and week out I don't think it would be nearly as big of a concern, but when it's dominating lesser competition with lesser physical tools, you very much worry about how big a leap that is going to be and just how different it's going to be to have to beat the tackles he's going to have to beat in the NFL versus the tackles he had to beat at Boise State. And so when you don't have those physical tools, you feel less great about it translating. To me, though, he's beaten uh, or he's been as productive or more productive than any other edge defender we've seen, you know, non-Power 5 edge defender we've seen, like I've said before, the only guy to ever put up back-to-back pass rushing grades of 92.0 in back-to-back seasons. Not None of the Boses did that. Miles Garrett never did that. Uh, Chase Young never did that. Like th- th- his production over the last two years has been off the charts. Three straight seasons of at least 20-plus combined sacks and hits. Like he's just gotten the job done no matter who he's faced. And so at that point, like the gap is, like these guys are still offensive tackle. Like they're still... Uh, some of these guys are still good tackles that he's facing. Like they're not all purely mm-hmm. just awful. Uh, even despite you know the level of competition, he was going up against a guy in practice. Uh, you know, pretty much every year for the last three years, and Ezra Cleveland, the left tackle for Boise State, who's going to be drafted himself. So I think uh, you can get some if you get some practice film on him, see how he does in those situations. We'll feel a little bit better about him. But I, I just think that he is he's number seventeen on our board because that production is so off the charts that I feel good about translating. Yeah, to kind of highlight those two concerns you mentioned, it, it's he doesn't have the ideal athleticism that you want at that position, and you factor in the level of competition. Those two factors will probably have him fall a little bit, but like you said, the production is absurd. And I also, watching a little bit yesterday of Curtis Weaver, I mean, he wins with his hands very well. I think he can win quickly, too. Like Despite, you, you have to win quickly to be a top pass rusher in the NFL. You have mm-hmm. to be, be able to beat off the tackles very quickly, not with your second move constantly, but with your first move, and I think he showed that on his tape. Let's go to the next guy that could be a value pick that slips into round two, Jordan Elliott of Missouri. Best best graded interior defensive lineman this past year in college football. This guy, a great pass rusher, good first step. I mean, this is where the NFL is going with these interior defensive linemen, not the mountain of a man that Derek Brown is, but Jordan Elliott still, I think, can be a productive player in the NFL. I have a take. Mm-hmm. I think Elliott is going to be one of those guys that throughout the draft process you start hearing oh he's been rising up draft boards Mm -hmm. and i think it's just more like oh people are finally getting around to he wasn't a name at all heading into this year he had only played only 395 snaps wasn't even a starter for missouri last season comes in this year or actually had two monster games towards the end of last year against tennessee and against arkansas we put him on as one of our you know breakout sort of candidates this year dominates through the sc schedule i just don't think a lot of guys have gotten to Missouri's defensive line tape yet. It's the mm-hmm. thing. It's like you don't think there's a lot of prospects. Like I think he's a guy that the more people will see, the more people will be like, oh, this dude's for real. Because there's not a lot that, like, he's not as freakishly athletic as probably Derek Brown. Or not as strong as Derek Brown, not as athletic as Javon Kinlaw. But, like, he ticks, ticks all the boxes you want at the position. He has size. He's 6'4", 315, long arms. I mean, has some power, has some quickness. Like, he has pretty much everything you need to succeed along at the defense tackle position. Uh, I would not be surprised, or I'm not saying I am not would not be surprised. I firmly believe he's going to be a riser. Probably ends up in the end of round one if I had to bet right now. I mean, especially with where the NFL is going, this guy can be an impact player as an interior pass rusher in today's pass happy NFL. Yeah. We saw, what I mean, I'm not comping him to Chris Jones, but when you have a guy that from the interior that can be a difference maker, uh, play, every, play every play, and, and it's like Chris Jones had that impact in yeah. the Super Bowl. I think Jordan Elliott, maybe not, you know, doesn't have the same size or whatever, but I think can have similar pass rush production at the next level. Number 22 on PFF's big board, but slipped out of the first round of this latest mock. Julian Aquara, Notre Dame edge defender. Super good athlete. Super good athlete. And I think people are going to fall in love with this guy at the combine. I could imagine him, after the combine, him yeah. rising up boards as well. I, I can't, to me, fathom why so many people are pumping up Caleb on Chase on LSU Edge Finner. 
and are low on Julian Aquara. Like those two don't necessarily mix to me. To me, they're like the same player mm -hmm. in terms of athletically. Okay, they're not the same player. That was bad. They're, to me, they're very similar players in that athletically, they can do anything you want them to do at the position. And, and they're not, and even though they're undersized, they both have shown they can bull rush at a high level. Aquara, though, was still more consistent, still graded out far better for us here at PFF, even if you compare both their just junior years. Uh, Julian Aquara had an 86.5 pass rushing grade. Kaylon Chason was below 80 this past year. Like, and Kaylon Chason had a lot of obvious pass rushing situations at LSU. Like he knew they had a lot of second half leads where he knew all I have to do is attack the passer and still didn't necessarily get the job done. So that's, I don't know, that's concerning to me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, to me, I don't know why, like what the big difference is coming from. I may regret saying this in like a couple of years after, you know, Caleb great in the NFL and Julian Aquar stinks. But like, I, I truly believe that Aquar is the better prospect right now. Uh, and they're, they're on similar sort of athletic tiers uh, on the edge. And I don't even think that's your Notre Dame bias. I, you've been high on yeah, yeah. Julian Aquara over Caleb on Jason for a while now, I think for all the right reasons. Number 25 on PFF's big right board, reason. Ashton Davis, uh, safety from Cal. I mean, we heard some rumors from guys, I was talking to some guys who had some sources in the NFL say, this, there, there isn't a softer safety in this class. Like calling this, calling this guy out for his lack of physicality. But you turn on the tape, I see a different player. I mean, this guy's willing to hit. I mean, he's not a guy that you're going to want to play in the box at the next level, mm -hmm. but he's not. he doesn't shy away from contact and I, I also love his athleticism love his demeanor after talking to him a bit in, uh, in mobile I, I think ashton davis is getting slept on for the wrong reasons talk about the right reasons yeah. this is the wrong reasons for uh for ashton davis as i say he's been one of the better tackling safeties over the course of his career he has only 19 missed tackles on almost 170 attempts in his career like that's for a safety when you're usually tackling out in space that's a pretty good rate so i i I don't really see those same things. Like I'm not again. I'm not playing him in the box. He is uh, sort of on the smaller side for a safety. But I like he's he's a guy that you covet for his coverage ability deep, and that's that's like what you that's that's really all that necessarily matters at the safety position in the NFL today. If you are uh, not going to be a completely versatile type of chess piece. Jalen Johnson is another guy I want to highlight that could slip in round two. But honestly, the more I hear, the more I read, I, th I think Jalen Johnson yeah. is going to find himself in round one. A guy that does not give up the big play. I, I think he had a, a ton of success at Utah. I think he's a guy, like you said, very instinctive player that could have four plus interceptions a year mm -hmm. in the NFL just based on what he could do when targeted. Uh, give me, give me more about Jalen Johnson. Yeah, I mean he's just been very productive over the past two seasons. That's some of the best sort of instincts of any cornerback in this class call whatever you want like his ability to read routes and not get burned on double teams uh is very good like he has just not given up a ton uh over the course of his career at utah uh he's not going to tick i don't think the sort of like size boxes you love at the position he might be a little undersized for the cornerback but and that's why he might like so i i foresaw him and didn't have him in the first round of this mock because of that but Man, with the amount that teams need cornerbacks, he should go in the first round. Mm -hmm. Like he should go in the first round and put him there because and factor in positional value. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at you know back end. You got a linebacker going to the Packers at 30 and a linebacker going mm -hmm. to the Chiefs at 32. Both of those teams, even though they have Could invested score, in yeah. the secondary, I mean, go get yourself Jalen Johnson. Yeah, factor in positional value. I went on to uh, the Cincinnati Bengals podcast with Dan Horde, and he asked me what's you know what's the Bengals' position of need after quarterback, and I said corner 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 he's like oh wow every Bengals fan would say off ball linebacker but i was like dude think about this you yeah. cannot force positional value at the day uh, at the top of round two go get yourself a good cornerback guys that actually have uh, a ton of impact on the defensive side of the ball rather than kind of opting and forcing need a at the top of the second round all right, number 28 uh, on PFF's big board. Again, slipping out of the first round. This guy's got some heated debate on Twitter. Jalen Rager of TCU. Yeah. People people are on him because he's athletic. He's young. Dominator rating. I've seen some dominator mm -hmm. rating thrown around, but then people are also off him. Catch radius. There's some drops in his tape. Um, the drop in production from 2018 to 2019, but we are on Jalen Rager. We really do like this kid's skill set. I think with a better quarterback in 2019, he's up top a lot of boards, especially and we've talked about if he played for Miami or not Miami, yeah. Alabama, Alabama, Tennessee. Yeah. He's going to have better production. Yeah, I bet I I could very much foresee Rager still sneaking into the first round because I, I do think he's going to go to the combine and very much win the combine. Like he's probably going to run in the low four threes, forty inch type of vertical. Like that's how explosive he is. And we've seen guys, you know, Philip Dorsett. We we've, we've seen over the yeah. years speed. Damn, still don't gets compare him to Philip Dorsett. The, well, I'm just saying speed still <laughs> gets drafted in the first round. Yeah. Like Philip Dorsett terrible production at Miami 
you know, not uh, limited catch radius in his own right. Much more of a raw first. route oh, runner, yeah, yeah, too. Like, his oh, route running was... Rager's raw. much better player than Dorsett was coming out, but we, like I said, Dorsett went in the first round because of that speed, so I do think Rager has a chance of making it in the John first Ross, round well. too. I mean, John Ross, that. again, was a similar speed. Uh, number 29 on PFF's big board, Cameron Dancer of Mississippi State. Again, these cornerbacks, Jalen Johnson, Cameron Dancer at the back end of the first round. These guys are sneaking in, in my opinion, as, as more teams buy into the fact that cornerback position is so valuable, and I I know mm-hmm. it's very scheme dependent too. There's going to be some cornerbacks that are off teams' boards, knowing the defense they do play. But I think Cameron Dancer, or Jalen Johnson, both of these guys, man, I, I think if you're a team that went to the postseason this, you know, this past year, and you're at the back end of the first round, pulling the trigger on either of those two, it would be a, a step in the right direction. I think Dancer does have some speed concerns that he, he'll have to answer, at, and is why a lot of people aren't as high, and I'm probably as we are, number 29. He'll have to at the combine. Uh, he may run in the four fives, which four five plus you're just going to be hard pressed to see a team draft you in the first round that just like doesn't happen they rarely take a chance on guys like that you have to be pretty damn good at everything else and i do think dancer is that's why we're still high in him but i just he might not have the speed necessarily like and if you don't have the speed and you're like slightly built yeah that's what i was about to say he's not gonna have the speed he's also like 189 pounds that's that's just a tough sell for teams but dude you, you can't teach uh what he's done at the position the sec the last two years all right, number 30, th- this guy, I mean, he could potentially slip a little bit down further on our board, too, just no, depending on where he no. has it with the injuries. Natani Muti of Fresno State. Don't you dare say that. He's not moving. <laughs> he's going up, if anything. All right, game changer for Fresno State that's really just battled injuries. It's the only reason that people yeah. don't really even know this guy's name is that he's battled injuries. But when healthy, and we say this every time monster. we bring him up, he's an absolute monster, arguably, and in this case, the best guard in this class when healthy. And the thing I love is, like, a lot of – uh, you know, you think of like Maulers in the running game. You think of Jr. Sweezy. You think you think it almost comes at the detriment when, when a guy is really uh, that aggressive in the run game. It comes at a detriment to his pass protection. But that is so not the case, with Muti. Like he is so patient. Like his pass sets are gorgeous, and he was good at left tackle too when they moved him out there his sophomore year in the couple games before he tore his Achilles. He didn't allow a single pressure there, and that was going up against Carter Coughlin in Minnesota as well. Like he he actually looked like he could play left tackle now he's not going to be in the nfl he's still got uh only six three limited ish length does doesn't have the profile you want at the tackle position so he's going to be a guard but i think he's going to be the best guard in this class and to me he's one of the best guard prospects we've seen since uh you know quentin nelson like he is just a very just very solid prospect i don't know like it's hard to describe exactly why we haven't seen a ton of tape on him over the past two years only five games he's played in since 2017 but he's been damn good in all of them uh, reading through some of the YouTube comments during that, and I, I think you know Curtis Weaver gets brought up, and that some guy says yeah, Curtis Weaver's fat. I'm not going to argue that. I'm going to be <laughs> honest. You watch his tape, specifically at the back Bad end body. of the season, that guy's body is like, oh man, looks like Mr. Potato Head up top. He needs to show up at the combine a little bit more jacked. I'm telling you right now, this guy mm. should be on a he, he very to, light diet. I, the anti jakai polite. Yes, the anti jakai polite. I agree with Where that 100. percent Polite, play jacked, and then show up at the combine fat. Yeah. Play fad. This guy shows up with bad weight. I mean, I mean, dude. Like, hopefully, he's getting the advice right now. Like, hey, you need to show up pretty cut here. Like, I mean, we can't, we can't have you take your shirt off. I mean, that should be every like you're a professional athlete. I hope you. Yeah. No, I know, but I mean, it's easier (laughs) said than done. You get addicted to Swedish fish. Next thing you know, you go down this trail. Uh, Number thirty-one. Last guy we want to bring up that you know inside that top thirty-two of PFF's big board that didn't make this first round mock is Brandon Ayuk, the Arizona State receiver, explosive dude, former JUCO transfer that had good, didn't have good production from Nikhil. Harry was there, but mm-hmm. they force feed their top guy. Nikhil Harry was force fed, and this past year, Brandon, U- Brandon Ayuk was force fed. I still wish I could have saw him at the Senior Bowl. I, think I wanted to see mm-hmm. him run, you know, intermediate and deep level routes. I wanted to see him create separation against some of the cornerbacks down there. He didn't have a chance to do that. He was flagged in the physical process. But man, Brandon Ayuk, I still really do like those traits, and I think that's why he is there at number thirty-one. Yeah, so he's not even six foot tall, but he has an eighty-one inch wingspan, which was longer what? than anyone else's <laughs> exactly anyone else's at the senior bowl so like you had chase claypool who's six four there you had uh antonio gandy golden who's six five there uh what's his face colin johnson who was i might six, be able six. to fly with those like exactly. he could take flight yeah. with those arms. 81 inch wingspan was longer than all of those guys uh so he has he has a bigger catch radius than you would expect for a 5'11 wide receiver very explosive unbelievable after the catch highest yards after yak average of his career of any of the receivers in this draft class so uh there's a lot to like about Ayuk. you know what i think it might do raw but a lot to like with brandon Ayuk, i i watched all of his 
all of his routes for Arizona State this past season. I didn't watch any from 2018, but I think it might be it might be good to go watch what he ran at JUCO because what the routes he's running at Arizona State are way different than you know what, what, uh, or are very you know shallow routes, a lot mm-hmm. of like y- yards after the catch stuff. But maybe his JUCO offense actually pushed this guy down the football field. It'll be interesting to see. I know against bad competition, JUCO competition, but I want to see him run those routes. I, I want to see him run. Those I know routes. it would have been nice. He, he very much could have made himself some money at the Senior Bowl. Unfortunately, I mean, especially with the cornerback class, oh, he probably would have been unstoppable. Him against. He's saying Bassey would have been just unfortunate. <laughs> unfortunate again. again Bassey happened. didn't need that. So <laughs> he, he already, thank, thank God for Bassey. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.